Good morning, guys. Greetings in the name of Jesus Christ. How is everyone doing? I don't know if y'all can hear this. The rain is gone and the birds are singing. This is the middle of winter for us down here in Texas. Um, something interesting about our verse we're going to read today, and this is something that a lot of people, um, it, it kind of ties into this. The, the target verse today is Isaiah 63, 7. I will mention the loving kindnesses of the Lord and the praises of the Lord according to all that the Lord hath bestowed on us. <clears throat> you know, a lot of people have a problem with uh, the verses that talk about we were made for the Lord's good pleasure. And they think so, what, and like atheists will say, so that's telling me that we were made for his entertainment. Well, no, that's not what that means. What does the Lord take pleasure in? Scripture says he takes pleasure in blessing his people. He takes pleasure in providing for his people. He takes pleasure in, in making a way for his people. He takes pleasure in saving his people. And so if we were made for the Lord's good pleasure, and that's what he takes pleasure in, it's a win-win. It's not something where we were just made to you know be a little puppet show for him, like a lot of people want to try to portray it as. That's not the case. It's absolutely not the case. <clears throat> because the loving kindness, the mercy, and the grace of the Lord endure forever for the goodwill of his people. He gets glorified in it. And the so the blessing circles around. The Lord blesses himself by blessing us. He glorifies himself when he glories us. He provides for himself when he provides for us. Now, that's not to say he has to do that, but that, that's how it comes together. I and mean, if you pay close attention to the scriptures, you see that, you see that how it, how it plays out. And so we're going to get into our verse here and read it in context. The whole verse says, I will mention the loving kindnesses of the Lord and the praises of the Lord, according to all that the Lord has bestowed on us and the great goodness toward the house of Israel which he has bestowed on them according to his mercies, according to the multitude of his loving kindnesses. I find that very interesting. Did you notice what he did there? <clears throat> it's a small detail, but it jumps out once you see it. I will mention the loving kindnesses of the Lord and the praises of the Lord, according to all that the Lord has bestowed on us. Comma and the great goodness toward the house of Israel. Notice he's differentiating between the two. What is the us? We know who Israel is, but who is this us he's talking about? This is Isaiah, this is Old Testament. Who's the us? Interesting, small detail, could have big implications. So let's go up here and let's read in a little greater context what we're looking at. So this is Jesus. We'll start in verse one, the Lord's day of vengeance. Who is this who comes from Edom with dyed garments from Basra? This one who is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength. I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. It's Jesus Christ. This, this is Jesus Christ. Why is your apparel red and your garments like one who treads in the winepress? I have trodden the winepress alone. Sorry, I have trodden the winepress alone. And from the peoples, no one was with me. For I have trodden them in my anger and trampled them in my fury. Their blood is sprinkled upon my garments, and I have stained all my robes. For the day of vengeance is in my heart, and the year of my redeemed has come. I looked, but there was no one to help, and I wondered that there was no one to uphold. Therefore, my own arm brought salvation for me, and my own fury, it sustained me. I have trodden down the peoples in my anger, made them drunk in my fury, and brought down their strength to the earth. Then the Lord's mercy is remembered. I will mention the loving kindnesses of the Lord and the praises of the Lord, according to all that the Lord has bestowed on us and the great goodness toward the house of Israel, which he has bestowed on them. Notice he makes a differentiation between two different groups here. On them, according to his mercies, according to the multitude of his loving kindnesses. I thought Isaiah was one of the Jews. Kind of makes you wonder what he's talking about. Verse 8, for he said, surely they are my people, children who will not lie. So he became their savior. In all their affliction, he was afflicted. And the angel of his presence saved them. 
In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them, and he bore them and carried them all the days of old. Read that again. In all their affliction, he was afflicted. This was before Jesus came. And the angel of his presence saved them. That's Jesus. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them, and he bore them and carried them all the days of old. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. So he turned himself against them as an enemy, and he fought against them. Then he remembered the days of old, Moses and his people saying, Where is he who brought them up out of the sea with the shepherd of his flock? Where is he who put his Holy Spirit within them? who led them by the right hand of Moses with his glorious arm, dividing the water before them to make for himself an everlasting name, who led them through the deep as a horse in the wilderness that they might not stumble, as a beast it goes down into the valley, and the Spirit of the Lord caused him to rest, so you lead your people to make yourself a glorious name. Then he goes into prayer, prayer for mercy. Very interesting stuff here. <laughs> the good pleasure of the Lord is to interact with his people. And this is something I, I kind of, it kind of dawned on me years and years ago, way before I started doing this. But I was thinking and meditating on, on why, what makes us so drawing to the Lord that he would, he would even want to consider us. And the Bible talks about this. There's something very interesting about the intimate communication he has with mankind. What is it about us that makes the Lord watch over us, makes the Lord pay attention to us, makes him view everything in our lives? He really goes for and derives great enjoyment of the little details concerning us, the little idiosyncrasies, watching man figure things out, watching man come to a new conclusion, watching man grow in spirituality, watching watching man realize things in, in all of God's abilities. It seems like the one he, he really pay, you know, digs a lot into is the one where he interacts with us, you know, stitching us together finally and perfectly in the womb and seeing us change our minds, seeing us draw closer to him, seeing us, you know, do things differently, think about things differently and become different. There's something about the little details. You know, the Bible says that he, you know, there, there's, he knows it when the dew drops evaporate. A bird falls out of the sky. He knows it. You know, every blade of grass that's cut, every one that grows, he knows it. So detail is very important to him. So I find that interesting the way he interacts with us. It's very detailed. More detailed than we realize. <clears throat> so the Lord takes great pleasure in us. Of course we were created for his pleasure. But not the kind of pleasure we think a much different kind of pleasure. And it's a pleasure that he takes in us, in blessing us and growing us and changing us and saving us. Very, very interesting. The approach that God is taking to this, it's nothing like us. Completely different and foreign to how we think. But he takes great pleasure in that. And canst thou not do this? Do what? Mention the loving kindnesses of the Lord. And the praises of the Lord, according to all that the Lord has bestowed. And canst thou not, oops. And canst thou not do this? Are there no mercies which thou hast experienced? What, though thou art gloomy now, canst thou forget that blessed hour when Jesus met thee and said, Come unto me? Canst thou not remember that rapturous moment when he snapped thy fetters, dashed thy chains to the earth, and said, I came to break thy bonds and set thee free? Or if the love of thine espousals be forgotten, there must surely be some precious milestone along the road of life, not quite grown over with moss, on which thou canst read a happy memorial of his mercy towards thee. So can we do that? Can we look back on our life and find moments that just stand out to us where Jesus interacted on us? Of course we can. We, many of us have talked about him in the video or in the comments. What? Didst thou never have a sickness like that which thou art suffering now? And did he not restore thee? Wert thou never poor before? And did he not supply thy wants? Wast thou never in straits before? And did he not deliver thee? 
Arise, go to the river of thine experience, and pull up a few bulrushes, and plate them into the ark, wherein thine infant faith may float safely on the stream. Forget not why thy God has or forget not what thy God has done for thee. Turn over the book of thy remembrance and consider the days of old. Canst thou not remember the hill Mizar? Did the Lord never meet with thee at Hermon? Hast thou never climbed the delectable mountains? Hast thou never been helped in time of need? Nay, I know thou hast. Go back then a little way to the choice mercies of yesterday. And though all may be dark now, light up the lamps of the past. They shall glitter through the darkness, and thou shalt th uh, trust in the Lord till the day break, and the shadows flee away. Remember, O Lord, thy tender mercies and thy loving kindnesses, for they have never, or they have been ever of old. I want you to think about something. <clears throat> it's dark now. Is it possible to light a lamp behind us to light the way in front of us? Sure it is. So if we remember those things of the past, the light will illuminate forward as we move forward into the unknown. Now, what's another thing? The Bible says that, that his word is a lamp unto our feet. Remember, we've read that scripture. His word is a lamp unto our feet. So it lights the path directly in front of us. And some of that light goes down the path. The problem is, and this guy made this point, maybe not even realizing it. If we're not in the word, we don't have a light to the path in front of us. We don't have a light lighting up the darkness that is this world. <coughs> How can we make mention of the loving kindnesses of the Lord? Well, we have personal experiences in our lives, but if we're new Christians, we have the Bible. The Bible shows the loving kindnesses of the Lord. Job, Noah, Moses, Elijah, Elisha, Enoch, um, Jonah, Joseph, David, Daniel, Samuel, Hezekiah, Ezekiel, Micah. I mean, we can just keep going. You can name every name. So many. So many. We can go through and we can list all the loving kindness of the Lord by merely going through the scriptures. And so if we as if we can't look back on our lives and say, you know, I don't see the Lord there. I don't see times. No, I can't say that. I have to admit it because I've seen him all the way back when I was a little kid. If we can't as an individual look back and see those things, we can go to the Bible and we can find them. And so even if we don't have a lamp behind us illuminating what's in front of us, we have the word of God to illuminate it right around us. So imagine you're in the dark woods. Can't barely see where you're going. You know there's stuff out there you don't want to meet because to meet that stuff in the darkness is uh, terrorizing. All of a sudden you see a light walking through the trees. And so you start to work your way towards it. Ah, there's something I can, I can, there's safety there. And you start moving your way towards that light. And you meet up with that light. It's the person walking with a lantern held out in front of them. Why are you in these dark woods with this lantern in your hand? The light keeps the beast away. I have to have this light with me always. And it must stay lit always. Are you looking for safe haven? Come with me. If we're staying in the light, we, we will always be able to see. So, we go back into the past. We look at past experiences of where the Lord has interacted with us, where the Lord has stood on the mountain and, and in our defense, the, where the Lord has provided for us, where the Lord has protected us, put his body in between us and, and the enemy. And we see those things and those light up the path behind us and they shine some of that light to the future. We open the book, we open the word. We have experiences now with the Lord. These things light up. The path in front of us. And so as believers, 
having the word, having our own experiences, these things illuminate what's going on around us. We learn from all of them. Not only can we learn from the Bible, we can learn from past experiences. Seeing the Lord interact, we look back now, we're like, oh, I see what the Lord did there. We start to see it more in more detail in the future as it happens to us now and in recent days and even years. That's why it's so important for us to be reading. Reading this book helps you see him active in your life because you start to learn what to watch for. Naturally, we don't have the ability to watch for it unless the Holy Spirit, you know, makes it obvious. And I used to pray to the Lord all the time and tell him, Lord, I'm dense. I'm, I, I don't get hints. I, I struggle with little things like that. I need you to be bold and upfront with me. I appreciate somebody who doesn't beat around the bush and just tells me like it is. And there, I've met people in my life that were just the nicest people, but they never could get to the point. And they would spend a half hour explaining something when all they had to do is say it in one sentence. And I've had other people, other friends who nobody had cared for and nobody liked. But I love them because they were direct and to the point. I didn't particularly care for their attitude, but I had a great deal of respect for them because they didn't beat around the bush. They got right to the point. Can we mention the loving kindnesses of the Lord and the praises of the Lord according to all that the Lord hath bestowed on us? Can we? Sure we can. Now there's another verse that comes to mind uh, in the scriptures where it says, uh, who can recount all the blessings back to him? Who can recount all the blessings back to you, Lord? All the things that you've done for us. Who can, who can count those back to you? Nobody can. But what's, what's amazing is being able to see it. Being able to see all these things and then start to learn and know it's even more than what I've seen. Because there's things that are being done that I'm not aware of. You know, the loving kindness of the Lord goes far beyond what we can imagine. A lot of people think of it from a carnal standpoint. Well, I need a new car. He didn't do that. I need this. He didn't do that. I need that. He didn't do that. And I see a lot of people out there that... Uh, Blame others for their problems and, well, you didn't help me when I needed help. I didn't have the ability to help you. <laughs> well, you didn't help me when, when this was going on. I didn't have the ability to help you. But they want to blame God on that too. Well, God, you didn't give that to me the way I wanted. Well, maybe that's not what you needed. That's what I tell people immediately when they say that. Well, maybe that's not what you needed. He gave you what you needed instead of what you wanted because what you wanted, you would just hurt yourself. He gave you what you needed so you could be healed. They don't see it that way, and nobody seems to explain it that way. <clears throat> we should be able to look back on our personal interactions with the Lord and personal experiences and add that to the gospel. The gospel first, and then our testimony. Sometimes our testimony first, and then the gospel. But our testimony opens the door, turns a light on, sets the stage for sharing the truth of the gospel with people. So like Isaiah does here in Isaiah 63, we must mention the loving kindnesses of the Lord and the praises of the Lord according to all that the Lord has bestowed on any of us. When we do that, people get a different insight into God because you go and you you talk to charismatics or some of these other people, you know, what, what they do is, is weird. The things that they talk about, things they mention are, are weird and people get turned off by that. They're like, well, that doesn't sound like something God should do. It's funny because there are unbelievers that have that sense. Well, that doesn't sound like something God should be doing. But then they talk to an actual believer who ha has had actual experiences with the Lord. And they're like, now that sounds like God. And then the door is open. And so we must make mention of these things because it's important. It's important to sing the praises of the Lord. It's important to speak of the works of his hands. In the Bible, in our pasts, and what's coming in the future. Because for most people, and I know that I've used this saying, I haven't used this saying in a long time, but for most people, the only Bible they will ever read is you. And it just may be talking with you. Is there will be their excuse to open that Bible up and finally look at it. 
Father, we come before you this morning in the name of Jesus Christ to give you praise, honor, and glory, and to lift you up and sing praises unto your holy name. Father, thank you for this holy word, and thank you for this devotion. This, this Bible has just been beyond a well of information. It is a vast ocean with no shores. It is just full of information. It, it just never ceases to amaze me how much more we can find, even in just little parts of the text, little nuances, big information. In this particular verse that we're, we're dealing with today for our devotion, Lord, it, it talks about us speaking of your loving kindness, your praises, according to everything that you have given us, that you've bestowed on us. Now, a lot of us think of this from a very carnal perspective or a worldly per perspective in that it is physical things. <clears throat> it's also spiritual. You, you, you provide both. I mean, one of the most important things is when you open our eyes, open our minds, open our hearts up to your word. Because then we start to read your word. It starts to help us understand what happened in the past. It starts to help us look back and go, I see his hand there. I see his hand there. And then we start to realize just how much you've been in our lives, even before we were saved. I look back to when I was a kid, and I'm thinking of memories right now from one of my, one of my fondest memories. Uh, way back when we were, when I was little, we were living on a, on a huge farm out in the middle of the Missouri woods. And it was wonderful. And I, re I remember having a sense of you. I remember speaking of you, even though I wasn't saved, and, and knowing that you were there, even though I wasn't saved. And I, I have these, these things all the way across my, my lifetime. These amazing moments. And I never realized what that was until now. And then I look back. Now that I know what I know, and looking back, and I realize, wow, you were there the whole time. That's amazing. So, Lord... I have to sing of your loving kindnesses. I have to mention them. I have to sing your praises according to all that you have bestowed on me. I have to speak of your mercies and your graces and your everlasting love. Because no matter what we think we know, what you actually have done is vastly greater than any of that. We perceive only a small fraction of what's really been done. Because for those that are called by your name, you move heaven and earth for them. And it's amazing to me that you do that. And who are we that you would do that for us? Who are we that you would, do that, that you would even do you go that far for any of us? And yet you do. And we scarcely understand it. Lord, it is such a blessing to be called by your name. It's such a blessing to come to these understandings. Never let us take this as an opportunity for pride or take these things as an opportunity to think we're special. But instead... Make us to use these opportunities to glorify you. And when we get a chance, speak to others about this. Share these wonderful, wonderful truths with others. And maybe take some of these blessings you've given us and share them with others too, so that they can be blessed. And so that they will glorify you also. It's a beautiful and amazing thing to, to start to learn more about this and, and to see you working more, to realize that's your hand working, that's your hand working. That I mean, we've seen it recently, very recently. You have not been shy about uh, stating your opinions on what's going on around the world today, and it's amazing. So, Lord, I pray that every mouth sings your praises. I pray that every heart glorifies you. I pray that every mind is thinking on you. I pray that every heart is understanding about what your word says and what you're doing and what your desires are. And I pray that our lives as your children our lives as born-again believers will somehow glorify you and emulate you and so that others being around us will notice it. So others being around us will see it. And just maybe another open door will come up and we can plant some more seeds. Maybe another, another field will present itself and we can plant seeds of faith there. We don't know how much time we have. We're in a very key point in American history, but world history. 
everything is coming to a head very quickly. Uh, there's no end in sight. Uh, it only looks like it's going to get worse from here, and it is rocketing forward. So that tells us this, this is an important time. Amazing, amazing, amazing times. Lord, you deemed us worthy and gave us the privilege of being born now to see these things and to be awake and to be saved and to know the truth. Lord, to help, give us audiences so that we can share these truths with anyone and everyone we can. So that we can mention your loving kindnesses, the praises of you, and your mercies and your graces and your blessings. That all the things that you've done in our lives and then give them the gospel. The true gospel of Jesus Christ, our Lord. So that they can be saved too. Because we don't know how much time there is. According to everything we're looking at, there's not much. Very, very little. A lot of people are running scared right now because they've made a lot of claims and now they're worried that it's not going to get fulfilled. Lord, I'm looking at what you're sharing. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But I'm looking at what you, you've you been sharing and it points to a certain time frame. That's what I'm looking at. That's what we're all looking at. We're in that three-year time frame, it looks like. It could be wrong, but... I'm going to stand on what your word says. I'm going to stand on what have you, what you've been showing. Another loving kindness. And another thing that's worthy of praise over you. Where you have opened your word up. You've peeled back the pages. You've shown us so many things. How can we not pay attention? How can we not be awake? How can we not be watching? May your mercy endure forever. May your love be shed abroad in all our hearts. May, me, may you be forever glorified in us, in heaven, in the earth, everywhere, in all of creation, and then some. Father, thank you for your mercy and grace. Thank you for your great love. Thank you for your free gift of salvation. In Jesus' name, we bless you, praise you, honor you, and glorify you. And in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Guys, thank you for joining me for morning devotion. I, I, I stagger at just the sheer weight of the implications of all that's going on today and all that's going on here. And, and then just the, the, the incredible blinding glory of what the Lord is doing. And to see him so active now, I mean, I see him more now than I ever have. Yet, it's so funny, I look back at my life and I see him a bunch there too. Every one of us should be able to do exactly what Isaiah 63 is do, it says he's doing. We should be able to do that because it is incredible to witness him working, to see him operating. Why are we not in a complete world war? Why has nobody launched any nuclear missiles? Why hasn't it happened? There's been plenty of threats, and we've been at this for years. Why hasn't it happened? The Lord's holding it back. You can see his hand holding all these people back because they should have just rushed in and done what they're going to do, yet they haven't. Why haven't they? Their threats to start the uh, digital economy, why haven't they done it yet? The Lord's holding them back. Their, their, their threats to do this and do that, the Lord's holding them back. And this whole thing with the EV thing, a lot of people thought that was it. Look at that. It's collapsed in on itself. The Lord said, no, I'm not going to let you guys have it. It's going to go his way. Regardless of what mankind does, regardless of what man thinks, it's going to go his way. And his way only. And we can see that. And so every one of us that are called by his name, every one of us that are taking the title of Christian, that believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, believe on his holy name, must make mention of the loving kindnesses of the Lord, must sing his praises according to all that he has done for each and every one of us and for his people as a whole. And the very first thing that I will mention of what the Lord has done for his people as a whole is provided a book of remembrance and a book of future events called the Holy Bible. Brothers and sisters, read that book. Read that book and watch what happens. You will be amazed and everything will change for you and it will just cause your faith to grow stronger in him. I love you all very much. I bless you all in Jesus name and I'll see you in the next video.